So shall I start? Good, yeah. I uh, good morning, what's Lisbon. Going to be said in this program. <laughs> good morning. Uh, I'm Rob Cox. I'll be your moderator for this panel. The the title of the panel is legalizing innovation, um, and which to me is sort of like an inverse question. Like, why wouldn't you legalize innovation? I mean, I sort of start with the premise of asking uh, folks here, amazing panelists. Um, well, what's the alternative to legalizing innovation? Is it to making it illegal? I'm, I'm, I'll start with you, Prime Minister. Um, I mean, just the very concept of, 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 not, of, of legalizing innovation probably is anathema to what you're trying to do uh, in Luxembourg. <laughs> so the question to, to legalize the opposite would be to forbid. I guess to forbid innovation. Uh, not, so not the kind of thing you run on. But y you're joking, but I remember... No. Um, when we had the presidency of the European Union, I had uh, some uh, members of the European Parliament who asked me if we would block some part of innovation because this would harm on social policies and this would uh, let jobs disappear. So th this was a real question I got in the European Parliament. Um, I told to them, and especially as a European country, that uh, there are huge opportunities. Mm -hmm. And if we are not able to take them, jobs will be disappearing and others will be created and we will be we will need to take people from outside Europe to occupy them. So um, for me, it's not because I see innovation that I want to legalize something or to forbid something. The only fact is you need legal part two because it's a question of trust. And um, it's like in politics. A disappointed voter will be much difficult to get back. It's like a, cu a customer. If you have a customer and he's disappointed or he lost the trust to something, he will be very difficult to get back to. Right. So I think um, the legal position is in fact an, uh, also s a social, because I, I just told you before about the social issues with the jobs. It's the same um, when I have a digitalization in my country. If I don't put some obligations, if you're a businessman, you will just check the financial aspect. But I need also, for example, I don't want to have just uh, a 5G in future in the capital. I need it also in different parts of my country. Um, and I need to trust. So these are, for me, the most important thing to, 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 to legalize and to, to, to have guarantees also for the consumers. And on the other hand, what is uh, important in my government, we did everything digital by default. So right. instead of, uh, so I'm in charge also of the digital agenda, so it's easier to convince my prime minister being myself in charge of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Dirk, I mean, in Germany, I mean, legalizing innovation, is this something... I mean, it's quite interesting to think there were actually people, there are voters, who think innovation is a frightening thing. And so you shouldn't be legalizing it. You should be, I don't know, holding back and trying to cling to the thing you already have, the status quo. Has this been a problem in Germany? I mean, are we... Are we is the discussion a valid one, in the sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I think there, um, there is a discussion, of course, but I think the main question, um, what we have to have to answer is, is regulation bad or is regulation good? Or can also um, regulation be innovative? Um, for example, as the Prime Minister said, um, the consumers ask about trust if we have innovative new, um, new models, new role models. And for example, in Germany, uh, we have a lot of uh, startups in the fintech area in the fintech area and in germany we give them also the possibility to get a bank license so if the fintech startup get a bank license the consumers see oh we can trust him because it's official label from the authorities in germany and that is uh, making a level playing field for both for the old banking economy as to say this and also for the young fintech scene and if you regulate here and i think this is innovative regulation you can um you can give them a possibility to compete against the old banking economy, but you have a level playing field for the consumers that they can trust these new innovative models. And I think that is right. a great chance. So regulation is not bad. Regulation can be very innovative. I want us to go d dive a bit deeper on some of this, but let me ask you, Seth. I mean, you work with many of the big, the big tech names in Washington and who are, of course, spending a lot more time in Washington. Um, do you think that there is any danger of, of th that the United States is not legalizing innovation in the way that, for, for example, they might be doing in Germany or Luxembourg? No, I don't. Um, I mean, when, when I conceive of the notion of legalizing innovation, I think the question is, as Dirk was saying, do we have a system of laws that encourages or retards creative thinking? And, um, you know, 
I think for most of its history, many of the founding fathers of the United States thought that the, the entire enterprise of independence from European norms and structures was an exercise in innovation, both social innovation right. and manufacturing innovation. And I think, you know, every country in the world, you know, with the possible exception, I suppose, of, you know, Burma, perhaps, is aiming at fostering innovation. I mean, we're talking about jobs creation, we're talking about giving people a more democratic access both to governance and to technology and to, uh, to life science advances. And I think you need to ask the question with respect to each of our national economies and the international community, you know, three questions. One, is the government doing enough to create an environment that trains and encourages creative thinking and risk taking? And here I have in mind the structure of higher education and the structure of government funding for basic research. The second thing is, our, are the national laws and international treaties that protect investment in intellectual property advancing the agenda or retarding the agenda? And this is a very controversial subject as to which large industries in the United States will disagree. And the third area is, are there laws and procedures in place that encourage and protect capital investment in disruptive technologies and innovation? And here, I think that, you know, this is largely a system of national regulation and you know, different countries, the countries represented here, are experimenting with doing that in different ways. Well, this is interesting. I mean, what, what you, there is also this dynamic of competition. And, and so the, the legal and regulatory framework that a country, that a country decides upon may be the deciding factor for whether or not, I don't know, you look around here, all the startups, they could move their domicile, their headquarters to Luxembourg or to the United States or, or Germany. I mean, how much of this is, um, do you see it as a competitive dynamic, Prime Minister? The first thing you said, uh, if they move to Luxembourg, that's a good choice. <laughs> see, um, already, I think we can see the competitive juices flowing. <laughs> just, just the fact is, for the moment, I have to tell you that very often we run behind innovation. The situation is now different than 20 years ago. 20 years ago, you were able, as a government, to give some directions. Nowadays, everybody with his phone at home can decide things. Even if there are rules and he needs to read, you know, I agree, I agree, I agree before even have reading an anything. So the fact that the consumer's role, as I told you before, some MEPs asking me to how to block innovation, the consumer's role won't accept. He doesn't accept that he, for example, in Europe, is not able to do the same thing that someone in Asia or in the United States can do. Right. And so the, the role of the, but the person, I, I give you an example of innovation, Uber. Uber is amazing, but the fact is for me too, it's I'm as a consumer, I use Uber, but what will be the taxes or the social insurances of the taxi driver? That's my political responsibilities to be sure that the consumers get what he wants, but on the other hand, not that I create new problems for the future. And so I need to find the right balance. And I think the balance is really there to promote innovation and on the other hand, to have guarantees, not that I will get more problems by indirect way. This, this shouldn't stop innovation. But we should just realize that nowadays the consumer has another role. He's promoting innovation by himself, where we as politicians were able to make laws to promote one or the Can other I, things. So what did you do? With, what, is, what is the status of Uber in Lu Luxembourg then? We call it web taxi in Luxembourg. And web taxi is the fact that for the moment it's it's a company where people pay taxes and they pay also social insurances. And when we had Uber was interested to come to Luxembourg, I told them, okay, but I just need a guarantee that someone who is working for you will pay his insurance. I don't want in two or three years someone who will discover that he has to pay taxes, that he has to pay insurances, that he has no social pensions, that he has no security pensions. So it is important to fight the right balance. And did they come? Is, is Uber available in Luxembourg? Not yet. 
that's you have to that, So you haven't legalized innovation in that respect. I didn't yet. legalize. I did. F I did not forbid. Right. I just said, if you want, there are also social competences. I'm as a politician needs also to see social competences. Not that afterwards being offering a service. Afterwards, I will have thousands of people who don't know how they will get a pension, how will they will get the social insurance. So I need to fight the right balance. And this is the most tricky thing, because my consumers, they want to progress, and they right. want to be able to order something. And on the other hand, I need just to find the, gar the balance guarantee. For example, in Germany, they have Uber in Germany, but it's a normal taxi driving for you as Uber, for example, in Berlin. And this is something we try to do too in Luxembourg and to fight the right balance. And if you see now the problems that they have with Uber in London or in France, you see that when you just say, okay, we don't care, afterwards you can have problems. So I prefer not to block, not at all, but to get around the table to find a compromise where we have some guarantees and we do the progress together. Just one is not enough. Well, and just to forbid it's a nightmare. So, so I want to promote, I want to develop, but on the other hand, I want also being able to guarantee the, 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 the next topics. It's the German experience. I mean, it's, you, you mentioned, that, I mean, I don't want to dwell, make this an Uber panel, but, <laughs> but I mean, it is, it, they are in many ways the, uh, the, the, the poster child for uh, coming into a country, uh, essentially evading the rules or making their own rules. In some cases, even when they are, have been sort of forbidden, they're still available. Uh, they were not available this morning. I don't know if anyone tried to get an Uber this morning in downtown Lisbon. But I'm just sort of curious, like, Germany, how do you manage this balance that the prime minister is talking about in the Uber example? First of all, I want to say something um, to your question. As the prime minister said, uh, is Uber available in Luxembourg or not? And he said no. And then you ask, oh, forbid innovation. But um, I think we have to ask the question, what is innovative in this um, in this model, of course, because is it uh, Uber who has a, an innovative model, of course, for the taxi driver scene, of course, or is it the so-called, um, let me say, German Mittelstand, small and medium-sized enterprises who are very innovative, who are the hidden champions in machinery? You see the big Hanover Fair, or are this, this are these the technology? innovations for the future as I compare it to Uber or the other question is how we handle this I give you an example for Airbnb I think it's also a big question at the moment here in Lisbon in Berlin we have um, some problems with Airbnb because we have high rents high payments for normal people we had a lot of tourists who come into town we have problems that you can with your normal payment you can pay the rent so um, we make a um, regulation for Airbnb a very moderate regulation for Airbnb in Berlin so that you have um, half of the year, you have the allowment to um, give your flat to Airbnb, to tourists, of course. Um, but, we s but, but there is the, the process also, if we see these developments, to care about social security, to care about um, security for the people who already live in the city, of course. And in the Ministry for Economic Affairs and Development, we see this development and we try to develop uh, what we call regulatory test beds that we in some areas or in test some villages, test bed, regulatory right. test beds, that we give the opportunity in some areas of Germany where they can have the possibility for some time, a year or two, test reg innovative regulation, to say this. And after one or two years, we say, oh, was it successful in these areas? Was it perhaps for the department, um, the, the county? Was it a successful idea or not? And I think these practical um, solutions, that is the way where politics can look on a development, but not at the beginning make a regulation, perhaps, and this regulation stops a whole innovative process. So we have, in this kind um, of time, I think we have to look from, as a politician, we have to look on the development, we have to test this, we have to give opportunities to develop this, but at the end, perhaps, regula regulation is necessary, but we see this after a process. I mean, you've touched on an I mean, what is innovation in a sense? Is, is, is disruption is not just, an, is not always, is not the same as innovation. Just because you disrupt the standing, the existing order with taxi drivers doesn't necessarily mean that you've innovated. It just means you've, in some cases, created an arbitrage between existing rules, those that may be protecting also the taxi drivers and their livelihoods, and trying to spark a, you know, a, a contract with the customer. I mean, wh how do you feel, in the, Seth, I mean, is this, is the U.S. sort of a free-for-all? or does, I mean, we don't seem to have regulatory test beds, um, and certainly, you know, everyone and their, and their college son is a Uber driver now. 
Um, so I, I think there, the concept of regulatory test beds in the United States exists in the federal model that we have where, you know, Justice Brandeis 100 years ago talked about the, you know, the, the genius of the federal system in which each of our states have independent political power subject to the supreme limited power of the so federal states government are the test and bed. states and local governments. So, for example, right now in Washington, D.C., that's a city that is rapidly discovering the benefits of bicycle commuting, which is an old story in most European cities. So the city started with a franchise that it, it gave for a company to put in thousands of bicycles in fixed racks, and it's become fantastically popular. The city then decided that it would test for 18 months a period in which any company that wants to introduce new, you know, single-use bicycles can do so without, you know, the bikes lock themselves. You leave the bike wherever you dockless want. You look bikes. on your dockless bike. The bikes. Chinese model. And so in the space of the past month, four different companies have come into the United States. And they're all Chinese. Each with a different color. They're not all Chinese, no? but the largest one Mobike is Chinese. Mobike and Ofo Mobike. and, yeah, yeah. Um, and they're all over the place. And the... Many, many other cities in the United States are watching what the experience will be in terms of traffic regulation, safety regulations, the economic model, how it will work. But I, I think, you know, the focus on, you know, Uber, Airbnb, we're, we're, we're talking about a, just a very small slice of the question of encouraging, promoting, and regulating innovation. We're talking about we're now talking about companies that not only, you know, had a bunch of engineers who had a cool idea and they wrote software and they got some either crowdsourced funding or angel investing, proved their concept, then did an initial public offering and are now, frankly, mature companies that are posing social tax and other economic questions for government. But when we're talking about encouraging innovation, we really are talking about, I mean... Let's take the Human Genome Project as an example. So it wasn't very long ago that nobody thought that it was possible to map the human genome. It clearly required a tremendous amount of capital investment in basic research. The U.S. government decided it was going to do a moonshot and put in, a, the National Institutes of Health put in billions of dollars in basic research. In the end, the the human genome was actually mapped first by a private company that had raised money to do it, but here it is. So now that it's mapped, what happens? There are all sorts of questions about how do we, how do we invent and develop and foster new therapeutic techniques given our knowledge of the human genome map. Where is the money going to come from? Is it going to be for basic research or applied research? Are there going to be legal restrictions on the kinds of things that can or can't be done? Are you allowed to clone a human being or not, to take the, the most egregious example? And what patent protection will there be for companies that make the capital and human investment to use recombinant DNA to create, um, you know, genetic therapeutics for, for disease. So that gets and to one of your can preconditions. You can you patent a human gene? Can you patent a human gene that's been manipulated? And these are very, very difficult and topical subjects that both our legislature and the Supreme Court are addressing with the idea of promoting innovation and protecting investment, but on the other hand, protecting against the kinds of innovations that may be antisocial or right. you know, against public policy. And also, you know, in the, in, the, in the space of innovators, whether it's high tech or the life sciences, everybody hates patents except for the patents that they own. And uh, how government, I'm, I'm, I'd be curious to hear how it is in, in, on the continent, but in the United States, for example, there is a huge division of opinion 
between the two sort of focuses of innovation in the United States. There's the high tech industry, um, which is largely represented by people sure. here, and which you know you can innovate by getting you know four university students in a dorm room writing software with an idea and writing software code and come up with something genuinely innovative versus which will probably if it's successful have a useful life in terms of months or a year or two versus the pharmaceutical industry right, which requires huge capital investment research and development how do you how do you yeah it's an interesting point i mean uber is is you know we're talking this it's is a mature easy, industry. This is not a giant moral decision, you know, or you know, the implications of, of the human genome are so much greater for for humanity. I mean, in, in I've just sort of Luxembourg's example. What I mean, what are you doing specifically on some of these fronts to legalize innovation, as it were, or to make it easier so that to, to make it easier for people to come, or for your Luxembourgians to actually innovate in ways that we're discussing. So the f the first thing is to help innovation. And we have a big, this is not in America, but in Europe, it's a way of thinking that you're not allowed to fail. Um, when you have once failed in Europe, it's very difficult to get up again. Uh, you, will be, uh, you will have a lot of problems to get help, to get credits. You will have a lot of problems to get public aid. So my government wants to support these risky things. Failure. You have to, yeah. We, we support part failure. Of capitalism. We support <laughs> right. also people who, are, who will fail. But right. I prefer someone who tried something and maybe he's going to fail than just to regret maybe that he could have got a success. So, and this is a change of mentality where it's important also as a public actor to support innovations and, uh, um, and, and not to block it. And so to invest a lot and so to have a also a public-private partnership. So for example, in Luxembourg, we did an, an initiative called Digital Luxembourg where I work with the private sector and where we uh, finance also and we have to make laws but we make as much law as needed but as less as possible so this is a bit the, the, the right balance as i told you before which is also a fact but we need it for example if we speak about e-health how should i tell to people that they are, are no legal frame with the with health which is such a personal topic where I tell to them, we don't care, they should just do what they want, and this is so personal. If I speak about autonomous driving, imagine if we'd say well, there is no legal frame, so just drive how you want, there will still be a code de la route which will be to respect. So we should, if we speak about digital innovation, and then we speak also about the whole innovation. In my country, we, it's not because we see an innovation that we say, how will I legalize or how will I legislate? It's not my, 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 my dream in the night to know how I will right. do something. But just to support at the beginning, to help. Now you know Bezos, when he created Amazon, he had four or five failures before having the success. Right. He had no friends during his four failures. He had a lot of new friends when he, had to move he to created Seattle. Amazon. Yes. But believe, maybe <laughs> Banished from New York. Ma maybe in Luxembourg would have been the same success. <laughs> but the fact is just that today we should in Europe, and it's not a Luxembourgish problem, in Europe support people even if they might fail. And if they fail, not to blame them and to, to kill them for business for their whole life. And this is something we have. In the United States, you, you, you support, you invest as a private man, you, you hope that it's going to be success. It's risky, but you do it. And we should also, as states, support people. I want to give a trampoline to people to jump and not a bet to lie. This is, for me, really how I want the next generations to be active. Too. Can I ask you just a follow-up on that, which is... Uh, we're going to have a, a, a speech, I think, from the EU Commissioner for Antitrust, uh, Ms. Vestager, in a little bit. Um, how, do you, how do you view some of the, the, the actions that the EU, the overriding body, has taken with regards to some of the big tech companies? In particular, I think the largest fine ever um, was, uh, was imposed on Google. How do you, I mean, how worried are you about these giant U.S. tech companies coming in and squashing all innovation in, in Europe and particularly Luxembourg. Uh, th the problem is that we have we have 28 regulators, 28 legislations. How do you want as a startup to be successful? 
<laughs> Google, Amazon, they don't care. They have lawyers everywhere. But as a little startup, if you want to be successful, you, ha you don't have this starting money to be able to invest in all the countries to fulfill all the regulations to be able to have this market. So we need a digital single market. I'm now sitting four years in the, in the telecom meeting, and we, I'm very happy that we had a meeting a few weeks ago, and we have again a meeting now in December where we'll get a formal agenda. We decided to have a formal agenda on the 5G for example, for Europe, so this will be, and so that we have a real agenda how we go on. We, we need to have a digital single market. In, in the States or in Asia, 500 million habitants in the States, one regulator. In Europe, 500 million habitants, 28 regulators, 28 legislations. <laughs> so common, geo-blocking is still a reality in Europe. So we need really to advance on these different topics. And I think as a European head of government, uh, and, uh, and, and the Ministry of Telecommunication, this is one of the biggest challenges for the next generations and that really, really have to be active. And I'm happy that we had in Tallinn a meeting with head of governments and head of uh, states a few weeks ago where we decided to put the digital agenda as real priority. There were some countries, they blocked. Right. But now I feel that there is a move to go in the right direction, and I'm convinced that we will be able to do that in the next month. Well, what is the conversation in Germany, Derek, about, about in particular these big tech companies, the Alibabas in China or the Googles and Facebooks, and they, they seem to be their sort of unstoppable dominance. Um, you know, how worried are you as, in, ter as, as in terms of what that does to potentially squashing startups and in, in, in competition in Europe, in Germany? First of all, I think, um, Google, Facebook, Amazon, they're very successful in um, B2C, of course. But I think um, if you take a look to Germany, if you take a look to German machinery, to German automotive industries and all, I think we are very successful in B2B Internet of Things. So we have also a lot of things to give um, right. to the United States and also to these tech firms. Um, somebody said, um, take a look to the, um, the, the new car from Tesla. It's not made in Germany, but it's made by Germany. German machinery, Germany robotic, of course. So we are also very successful um, in Europe. But I think Margaret Westergaard yesterday in an interview on the center stage, I think she says um, one important sentence. She said, also in the cases for the tech firms, the Google case, of course, we need a fair competition. We need a fair competition. We need a level playing field for new startup firms who also have the chance to develop, who also have the chance um, to get a successful business model, of course. And in Germany, we try to give these young startup entrepreneurs, these um, small firms, sm um, these firms, opportunities to develop. They give them um, some capital, of course, but we also put them together with wha what we call German Mittelstand. We have uh, in Germany a digital hub in initiative all over Germany. It's not just uh, Berlin, the city of startups in Germany. We have also Hamburg, Munich, Frankfurt, Cologne, Stuttgart, Ham Hamburg, of course, where there's also a great, um, also great opportunities for, young, for these young entrepreneurs to develop. And I see in Germany, I think we have this great potential. If we, um, if we get what these young entrepreneurs call the old industrial economy, but these are the hidden champions. These are the world market leader in niche markets. If we put them together with young startup entrepreneurs, I think that is a high and great potential for German industry and also for Europe economy. And I think um, what the Prime Minister said already, I think Europe is the answer. The European market is, of course, the answer. But we have already some things to do uh, in Europe, right. of course, but Europe is the great so one. It's, it's, so it's not just about stopping the big guys from coming in. Actually, it's about getting, getting your business affairs sorted out in Europe and having, rather than having 28 regulators figuring it out. Seth, we have one, two minutes left. So just your thoughts on you know, someone who's, who's actually argued in front of the Supreme Court when you were Solicitor General. Um, uh, do, you think, what, do you think the Supreme Court is going to have to think about some of the things that Margaret Vestager and the antitrust folks here who have been far more forward about um, than in the U.S.? Partly because I assume they're, not, they're, they're home, home champions. You know? I, so I, I just wonder how you think that whole antitrust discussion is going to... So I think, um, let me just say that, you know, in the U.S., there's also a concern about the, you know, the titans of high tech, whether it's Google or Amazon or Apple or Intel or Cisco, you know, essentially putting the brakes on innovation because it's very, very difficult for large companies with market dominance, just given their size and their position, to be quite as innovative as Sergey Brin and his roommates were in creating the model for Google. And 
there are a lot of interesting ways, both governmental and non-governmental, in which the United States is attempting to make sure that suppression of innovation by large companies doesn't occur. And we're, we don't have time to do it. You asked about the Supreme Court. Antitrust law in the United States is statutory. It's very, very largely a function of two regulatory agencies, the Federal Trade Commission and the Antitrust Division of the Justice Department. And antitrust enforcement and antitrust policies are very driven by the party in power. So the Obama administration had a very, very rigorous policy protecting small companies and small startups and being very skeptical of, you know, the flexing of muscles by large companies with market power. Traditionally, Republicans are much less interested in enforcing the antitrust laws in those areas, and it will be a really interesting thing to see. Where the U.S. Supreme Court is hyperactive in this whole area of innovation is in, in, in the structure of the patent laws. Last year, the U.S. Supreme Court heard 70 cases the entire year. Eight of them were IP cases. Six of them were patent cases. I argued four of them, and in many respects, they're the most important decision, most consequential decisions for the U.S. economy. All right. Well, I get the last word. I think Amazon and Jeff Bezos owning the Washington Post, which has been quite critical of this Republican president, we may see a change in the way the Republican presidents work on antitrust. Anyway, I want to thank this fantastic panel. Um, thank you, guys. Uh, please give them a hand and see you around the forum. Thank Thanks you. a lot. Thanks. We managed. Just, we did it. <laughs>